Motivation doesn't lead to action, but action leads to motivation. Ooh, I like that. So you've just got to get on with it. What people want changes over time. Yeah. So if you make it a process rather than an outcome, mm. then you're more likely to be satisfied and you're more likely to get it done. People over here do tend to just do what they want to do and, and be a lot more congruent because they're not, because they don't tend to be doing a nine to five job that they don't necessarily like. Hello and welcome to the first ever Brett Moran podcast. My name is Brett Moran, obviously, and in this podcast, we're going to have conscious conversations over a cheeky coconut, of course, because we're based in Thailand. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in some guests that really inspire me or friends that I've met throughout the years on my travels that I believe can inspire you and help you make some healthy choices to create more freedom, more fun and more adventure in your life. And today's guest is a very special guest, a dear friend of mine, and I'm really excited and I'm so grateful that he's agreed to be my first guest on the podcast. He is an author of six books. He is the podcast producer of Zestology, and he used to work for Sky. So I'm kind of feeling a little bit under pressure because he's a <laughs> professional um, presenter himself. Obviously, his name is Tony Wrighton. Tony, welcome to the podcast, there mate. There is nothing professional about my TV <laughs> presenting, <laughs> but I'm honoured to be here. I've flown all the way here. Yeah, flown all the way from the UK <laughs> to time, which actually yeah. would bring me straight on to the first question. Yeah. Tony is also an amazing father. Like, your child is the most oh. cutest kid I think I've ever seen. I love the connection. We've got such a special bond, right? What made you leave the UK and take your family over to Thailand for like three months? I think that is such a brave and bold move. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's interesting actually because we came here on holiday last year and we had a discussion and we said, wouldn't it be fun to live here? And then we realised we were just talking about us. We weren't talking about him at all. And then once we talked about it a bit longer, we were like, well, it's got to be good for him. And if it works for him, it'd be great. And actually what's been so great for us here is that we found this school that he absolutely loves. And he's going to little Thai school. He learns Thai language. Yeah. He learns Thai songs. And then out of school, he just loves life. And he's got his best friend, Brett Moran, yeah. who he loves hanging out with. And so it's been great. It's been, it's such a different travel experience, traveling with a child. But it's a lot easier now than when he was 10 months like old. Like a baby. We trying, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then you yeah. won't be looking at them every moment of the day and now he's, he's quite happy. So yeah, it's been a real experience doing it with him. But uh, yeah, it's been good. It's amazing. We had a really special day the other day, if he's all right to share. It was his birthday. Of course, yeah. He was yeah. a really big boy now. He's four, right? Yeah. And we actually took him to see the elephants. And I surprised him. I came behind him and sang happy birthday. Oh. But I think I think the best bit for me was just to see him and you yeah. as daddy and, 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 and like father, you know, or daddy and son interacting with those elephants. Like that was yeah. so special. Like, And what four-year-old yeah. gets to see elephants so close up like that in, in, the, in the, the world we can't live I in, know. right? I know, I know. And actually, I was messaging people at home, like his granny and that stuff like that on the day, and it sort of made me realise, wow, we are doing something very special here. Yeah. But what actually happened was you said, why don't I surprise him at the elephant sanctuary? And I was like, are you sure it's a good idea? Wouldn't it be nice for him to know and maybe like plan it? Um, and then you crept up behind him and he said, surprise, and you sang him happy birthday. And he was like, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> He's like looking at me. <laughs> Wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> it was beautiful. Yeah, he loved it. He yeah. loved it. Oh, yeah. mate, it was so kind of you to do that. And it's, no, mate, 100%. I just love sharing it. It's something so majestic yeah. and peaceful being, like you said yeah. it, like you were so blown away at how amazing that environment mm. was. And it was just, yeah, it's just very peaceful and beautiful to be with such huge animals. But again, yeah. there's very majestic, right? Yeah. 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 And I think one of the things that I, so obviously, as you mentioned, I do my podcast and I'm an author and stuff like that. And one of the things I've really been focused on out here is not everyone who listens to my podcast lives in Thailand. And the, and the generic advice cannot be, move to Thailand, you'll be all right. Yeah. And that's what I think you do so well as well. You sort of say, look, I'm here living the dream life. You could come and join me, but if not, here are some things you can do wherever you are. And that's yeah. why I've always loved yeah. you know, your meditations and your yoga and everything else, because it sort of works wherever you are. And that's something that I've been very focused on here, not just saying to people, you got to move to Thailand, mate. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think it's such a great point. I've had friends reach out, actually getting the ump with me over the years. Cause yeah. they're like, well, it's all right for you because you live in Thailand. Mm. And I would always say to anybody, like, don't, where, there's a great quote, wherever you go, 
you take yourself with you. Yeah. So when I first came to Thailand, I was still on the drugs, drinking. I was so lost. Yeah. I didn't appreciate all the things I appreciate now. So if I'm honest, I actually went back home to the UK and I banned myself from going on holiday for like three years. Really? Because I felt like I was trying to escape like my demons or whatever, my shadow self. Yeah. And so it's like, you're, you're not going back to Thailand. You're going to sit here, go through all the processes and the transformations inside. So now when people say to me, oh, it's all right for you, you can live in Thailand or I'm just going to move away. I'm like, yeah, that's great. But if you don't sort out your shit, if you don't sort out what's going on on the inside, then you're still going to take that problem with you. Yeah. You know, so I totally agree with you. People can move and travel and do anything anywhere in the world. Like it isn't like, it's not really where you go. It's where you are inside, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But, which really brings me up to a question we can really talk about positive, seeing the elephants, yeah. it's Stan's birthday. There must have been some fear or like, that's a big risk to kind of like, you have to rent your house out, move away, like take scan out yeah. of school. There's a lot of thought process. Like the average person sitting at home, you know, they're not just going to up and move to Thailand and take their kid out of school for three months. Like, did you go through any kind of like doubt? We did. And I think my family thought we were utterly bonkers. And my mum has actually said to me a couple of times when I've called her from out here, she's said, like, fair play, because I really thought you were, I didn't, you didn't know what you were on about. Um, and the day we left, we left on Christmas Day. I sort of thought, what am I doing? You actually flew on Christmas Day? on Christmas Day. Didn't know that. It's loads cheaper if you fly on Christmas yeah. Day. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> it's flights yeah. Yeah, yeah, Christmas yeah, yeah, Day. Exactly, yeah. Um, I was sort of thinking, what am I doing? Is this right for my son, you know? And it's just, it's worked out very well for him. You know, mm. kids do like routine. Yeah. And um, he's not getting much of that when he's moving to a different school and a different island and away from the people that he knows and loves. But yeah. what he is also developing is adaptability, resilience, learning mm. to explore and try new things, which isn't something that necessarily comes that naturally to a four-year-old. Yeah. So all of that has been, has been great, but yeah. I was, I was nervous. I was nervous. And, you know, we're sort of paying for two of everything as well because we've got a house in the UK, we've got a car in the UK, and we've got one of those here as well. So, yeah, yeah it's, all, it's, all, it's all interesting. But then here we are. And what a morning we've had. Yeah. We've walked along the beach and we've meditated and we've hung out and we've had, we're having a coconut, we're having a chat. And it's, it, it's it a different was so way of life. worth it. Yeah, all those, all those worries went very quickly once we got here. Yeah, I think that's yeah. what I was trying to get at. Like, because... Yeah. I know what it's like when you want to do something, even doing this podcast, I'm a little bit nervous, right? I'm interviewing you and, yeah. you know, but in a year's time, I'll look back and I'm so glad I did that. Yeah. I've kind of really learned over years through trial and error to lean into the fear. And actually the fear is a bit of a, it's an excitement maybe in yeah. disguise. It's, a, it's an opportunity of growth. But a lot of people don't see it like that. Yeah. And they might think very logical and analytical and like, and actually they're very valid. Your kid's yeah. at school, you know, Thailand's on the other side of the world, you know, what's going on over there? So that actually stops people sometimes, would mm. you agree, like to kind of take that action and yeah. it's not going to work for everybody, but I would say there's a big majority of people that don't follow their dreams. It might not be Thailand. It could be, you know, um, starting a business yeah. or, you know, traveling somewhere else. But the fear kind of holds us back before we even get into yeah. it. And that is not something that comes naturally to me. I am definitely someone who by nature is a little bit more cautious. I have to force myself all the time. Mm. And with a move like this, you can't do it in advance. There's nothing like, you know, we couldn't book a school, we couldn't book a house, couldn't book a car or anything because we needed to be here on the ground and see what it was like. Yeah. And the moment I'd done loads of Googling in a couple of months <laughs> beforehand, and I kept messaging you and you were like, don't worry about it, mate, just get out here, it'll be fine. Because I'm the complete opposite. Yeah, I'll like, yeah, just turn yeah, up. Yeah, so like, yeah. We're so yin and yang in a way, yeah, right? Yeah. Which is lovely as well. Oh yeah, yeah. I am an overthinker by nature. But I, I did a bit of Googling. I was oh I think that'd be nice to live there and that might be a nice school all of that was wrong but what we actually ended up doing is coming here with no plan and just sorting it out as we went and that's been fantastic mm. but it does require a bit of a leap of faith yeah it's a bit yeah. of trust as well right you've got yeah. to trust that it's going to work out I think when you've got structure and you've, you need, and, and you've got that routine yeah. you don't have to trust it's going to you know you've got the money coming in every week you've got a school that you can take the kids to you leave go to another country you don't yeah. speak the language you haven't got a clue what's going on, right? That, that's something I definitely learn from you all the time. You do not sweat the small stuff. Yeah. The other day we were driving up, because obviously where you live is this most incredible part of Koh Phangan, but there's, the roads are quite steep. Mm. And we've got a very small car with a small engine, which is not used to having more than one person in it at a time. And our car very nearly couldn't get up. Nearly rolled backwards. Near yeah, we nearly rolled backwards. I mean, we almost stopped. And there was one person in the car who just, didn't, it, not that you didn't care, you didn't even notice. You were just gabbing away in the back with Stan. <laughs> you just, you just, and there I was sweating away in the front. We're not going to make it, one. I think yeah, it yeah, came yeah, out of yeah. your mouth. And you were like, oh, don't worry about it, mate, just put, put your foot down a bit. And I was like, I oh, am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I mean, genuinely, I, I, I do learn from that, you know, because I am, 
in some ways it's a gift because I sort of have to work on it harder to, to work yeah. on the relaxation and stuff more. But in some ways I wish I was a bit less of an overthinker and a warrior as yeah. well. So yeah. It's funny because on the flip side, we just spent the morning looking at, we've got the Bodhi book and uh, coming out, you know, uh, in, the, in this year. And you're really helping me look at online marketing, Amazon yeah. and stuff like that, which I'm yeah. so grateful for, for this morning. It was amazing. I learned lots. Yeah, I did. I kind of like wish I could have a bit more of a thinking mind like this because I'm looking at all this stuff and I'm like, wow, I haven't got that logical. Do this step first and then that step. Then you do your ads and you put it up. Like I really like it. That was draining for me because I have to really focus where I'm like, oh, let's just see how it works out. And sometimes it doesn't work out. Sometimes you need, I think you've got to get a balance, I suppose is what I'm trying to say, right? You, it's sort of like the left brain is the sort of organized, analytical part of the mind yeah. that gets things done. And the right brain is the wafty, creative, living in the moment part of the brain. Yeah. And I am more left brain and you're more right brain. Mm. And actually you want a blend of both. And I think we both got a blend of both because mm. you are actually quite left brain as well. You get a lot done. You mm. do a lot. You don't just talk about stuff. You get it done. Here we are with like loads of cameras and lights and everything. You've, you've made this happen. Yeah. There's a lot of people who talk about this and don't get it done. So you, you, need, you need that blend of both. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I, I am someone who's in my professional life, I tend to be... I have a lot of ideas and I'll start them enthusiastically. And after about six months, I'll be like, I've had a new idea and it's even better. <laughs> Go somewhere else. <laughs> so I'm quite, I quite like hiring people to help me. Yeah. Who are very left brain and can carry on with that original idea while I go over to the new and one. And do something else. Yeah. 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 Which is really, a really good point to bring us on to. Like you've wrote a number of books and you're so like, I've been on Tony's podcast a number of yeah, times. You have. I've been a guest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Quite a few times now, right? You're a friend of the show. Yeah. A friend of the show. It's <laughs> lovely. Yeah. Yeah. We met at a yoga festival called Yoga Connects yeah. about eight years ago. And we literally had a, we had a meditation this morning. It was like, wow, mate, one minute we're in England somewhere at a festival, next minute we're yeah. sitting on a beach in Thailand meditating together. That, that just blows my mind. Um, which brings me on to the point, like, what do you write about? What is the passion that you're sharing with people? What's your message that you're sharing with other people to improve their health or their life or their relationships? Because, you know, I watch you as a father. I'm so inspired. I watch you in your relationships, how you talk to your partner. I'm like, wow, what? Like somebody who really does study the stuff and then implements it. Mm. So like, what are, what's your message to other people? Oh, cheers, mate. Yeah, well, I, I started studying neuro-linguistic programming almost 20 years ago. NLP. NLP, yeah. Yeah, which is, it's, it's a sort of a long name, but it's a study of how people do things well. It's very popular around the world. It's used a lot in communications, business, sales, but also therapy, health. Um, and then I started bringing out little audio books. Didn't really know what I was doing, but I was working in radio at the time, so I had a studio I could use. And I happened to bring out my first audiobook in the same month that the iTunes store launched. Mm. And they instantly started doing quite well. And they were just 30 minute, what you would call meditations now, but really sort of self hypnosis sessions. Um, and I, I guess over the years, I've honed my message more to focus in what I'm really passionate about. So, certainly energy, because I had a massive case of burnout myself. Um, wellness communication since i've worked in the in the world of communicating with people for the last 20 years and when you talk about passions just the act of writing itself mm. that for nobody else but me i get so much i wouldn't say joy but you know when you talk about deep work and you spend an hour and you think about nothing else but crafting the right sentences and moving mm -hmm. things around there's very few activities that i get that sense of deep work and depth from and I get that from writing. So that's why I love it. That's interesting yeah. because I can't think of anything worse than doing it. Really? Yeah, I like storytelling. And, mm. But when it comes to like the editing and trying to put it right, yeah. like I just, I'm like, I, I have this aversion. I need to back away from it. Yeah. How do you overcome that then? How do you, well, you just enjoy it. So you're saying it's like your passion. I enjoy it. I mean, the thing is that procrastination is, the, is a writer's enemy and, and mm. writers and procrastination have gone together since the start, since people started writing. And they, you know, what people say in the writing world is, motivation doesn't lead to action, but action leads to motivation. Well, like that. So you've just got to get on with it. Yeah. So like, don't wait to be inspired. Yeah. Just start and then the motivation will come. Yeah. Because presumably, while you hate it, once you get started, I know how much you've been writing here. Once you get started, you get on with it. Yeah, 100%, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I think action. I it leads to motivation. Action leads to motivation. Mm. I read a really great quote. I think it's uh, Stephen King's book. is uh, Memoirs of a Writer or something like that. Don't quote me on that just in case I got the wrong title. Yeah. But he basically says the only way to write a book is to sit down 
and write. <laughs> and I thought there was some kind of magic inspirational moment where I write it in a week or a month and it's like, no, pick three hours a day, you sit there and you make that a habit and you make that a routine yeah. and you be um, committed to that habit and routine. And that yeah. is like, that changed, changed my whole writing routine. It's like, mm. okay, Monday to Friday from a certain time, like say eight o'clock until 11 o'clock, that is my writing block. Yeah. I'm only allowed to write. I've got to be in a certain space. And if I ever go anywhere out of that, if I try and take a cheeky little ice bath early in the morning and then I'll come and write later, yeah. it never happens. Like, I'm just kidding myself. It's my procrastination, you know? Yeah. Or, so, yeah. Yeah, the, um, I mean, one of the big things in neurolinguistic programming is goal setting and mm. outcomes, as we call them. And I think I've, gone a, I've undergone a real evolution with goal setting because at the start, I did it very much by the NLP book and I would write down my goals as if they'd already happened in the, you know, in the past tense and I'd, I'd put a date on them. And that, you know, I actually did that when I wanted to be a TV presenter. I did that and it pretty much came true on the day that I'd written wow. the goal, way into the future. But now what I do is I've been very influenced by behavioral science, James Clear's book, Atomic oh, Habits. Brilliant book, I've read and, that twice. And, yeah. he, and he sort of says, you know, when you set these outcomes and these goals, people's, what people want changes over time. Yeah. So if you make it a process rather than an outcome, mm. then you're more likely to be satisfied and you're more likely to get it done. Guys, I know you're enjoying the video, but I've got a quick question for you. Are you okay with that monkey mind being a monkey? We've all got this voice inside the head, all voices, filled with self-doubt, criticism, judgment. But most people don't understand how important it is to master that monkey mind. So look, if you've got a monkey mind or a voice that is just busy inside your head and it never seems to shut up, I know exactly how you feel. And thankfully, I found meditation about 20 years ago. And so I have an amazing opportunity for you. It's the Bodhi Meditation Teacher Training Program. This 10 week program is designed to share with you eight Bodhi meditations. And the amazing thing about these meditations is that they are scientifically proven to help you reduce stress, reduce anxiety, uplift your mood, boost your energy. In other words, create that kind of lifestyle that energy and that health and that happiness that most people crave. Over the course of 10 weeks, I'm gonna be your meditation coach. And at the end of this course, you're gonna become a certified Bodhi meditation teacher. That means that you can coach people one-to-one, -one, you can work from anywhere in the world, build online courses, or even teach meditation at yoga retreats or anywhere you decide. So click that link below and together, will open up your heart so that you wake up feeling positive and literally this buzz for life. The link is below. Now you can get back to your video. Have an amazing day. So exactly what you've done, your goal is to sit down and write for three hours a day. And that's pretty much my goal as well. Mm -hmm. And then I trust that everything else will happen. So I've allowed my right brain to come in a little bit now. I don't have so many goals. Where I'm going to make a million pounds by next Tuesday. And I'm going to bring out three books as well. But I say, well, if I do this amount of writing, then it will happen over time. And I, yeah. and I love that. And I think that the science shows that it makes you happier to do it that way. To do it that way. Because mm. I think as well, you're going to, if you write out these big goals and you don't achieve them, yeah. You know, even though I'm Mr. Positive and I'm all yeah. into this stuff, you're not going to achieve everything, right? No. And you get to that kind of like five-year plan where you didn't achieve that goal, you're going to be a bit upset, right? You're going to yeah. be attached. Jack Canfield says, have 100% expectancy, but 0% attachment. And yeah. he's achieved some crazy goals. Yeah. Like, I think he sold nearly a billion copies of that Chicken Soup for the Soul book. Yeah. And I love that. And it really, when I heard that, that was a good reframe for me. Yeah, I'm 100% expecting this is going to work out. I'm going to give it all the energy. There's going to be days when I don't want to do it and procrastinate. Yeah. But if it doesn't work, I'm still content. And if it does work, I'm still content. Like, it isn't going to add. But just coming back to um, James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, I, you obviously know, and I don't know if anybody's listening, they've been seeing me on uh, Instagram, but I started Latino salsa kind of bachata dancing yeah. about eight months ago. And I must admit that bring up the most insecure feelings I'm not good enough, I'm stupid, why would the girls want to dance with me? And it really shocked me, because I'd been meditating for years, happy on the beach, and, yeah. and I went to ask these girls to dance, and I had all this anxiety and nerves, and you know, speaking up and doing all this stuff, this is like my, you know, this is where I need to really grow in life. I read James Clear's book, and he said something beautiful, it's like, don't learn to dance, yeah. become a dancer. Don't learn to play the guitar, become a musician. And he was talking for him, what I got, the, my interpretation was like, you, you become the identity inside yourself to then become that person that you want to become. And honestly, I go dancing now. I wouldn't say I'm the best dancer, but I've got that inner Latino. It's coming out of me and I'm shaking and I'm moving around. And it's all because I've, I've read his book and I've programmed into my head that I am now a dancer. I'm not trying to achieve a goal. I'm not trying to look good. I'm not trying to feel confident. I'm just in my head. I am a dancer. Mm. 
What do you think of that? Do you think that it's like, for me, it's like, that's shape, oh, that. that's yeah. like shape shifting. It's like, yeah. Cause I, I, are you taking me dancing tonight? Yes, I am taking you dancing tonight, mate. My son is very into the film Kung Fu Panda at the moment. Brilliant. I've got a feeling I'm going to be lumbering onto that dance floor <laughs> <Yeah>. like that. <laughs> My wife also said to me, you'll be the only single man there. Yeah. And I'm definitely going to get some video <laughs> footage. The only non-single man there. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting, you know, I mean, I do a, a New Year's Eve uh, or a New Year's Day podcast every year on goal setting and outcomes and processes. And I always record it with the same, same friend of mine, Dr. Stephen Simpson. And we both met on an NLP course 20 years ago. And we've sort of learned to approach things in different ways over the years and tried different techniques. And he took goal setting in its different way to extremes when he presented in front of 400 physicians, because he's a medical doctor as well. And he went on the stage with no plan, mm. no preparation, and no goal. And he said it was the best presentation he'd no ever done. No way. <laughs> so there's lots of, I couldn't ever do yeah. that. But he said, you know, just by trusting yeah. in the process, it sort of happened. That yeah. is not how I present. That's actually, I read so. that in a, in a monk's book. Uh, the monk was talking about the monks that teach the Dharma, mm. the Buddhism, mm. um, are not, allowed to take notes and prepare for their talk. They have to know it so well. So in other words, they've ordained as a monk for like 5, 10, 20 years. Yeah. And then when they give a talk on love and compassion, it has to just channel through them. They're not actually taking notes. And I thought that was brilliant because I always had to kind of like write my notes down word for word. I've done nothing for this podcast. I had the, in, in, uh, the intro yeah. and I just wanted to bounce off you with a few ideas. But if you went back a few years ago, I probably would have wrote this out word for word. And it actually made it worse for me because then if I came off of it, I'm not talking about it, I'd get so tongue-tied. Yeah. So yeah, this, I, think it's, yeah. I think what I get from that, there's just so many different ways of, of doing you. You might take notes, somebody else might not, and, and it just, it's what works for you, right? I think that's uh, something that I'd like to share with people. Thailand isn't for everybody. Taking your kid out of, out of school and coming over here, it's not for everybody, yeah. but it was for you. Yeah. And the congruence thing we were talking about at all, this, this is like a, a word in NLP, congruence, which really means sort of just being yourself, mm. authenticity. And that is, I think... Because I've come from a world of TV, which isn't very congruent. You wear clothes you wouldn't normally wear. You wear makeup. You're sitting in a very unnatural environment and you're projecting this sort of like, you know, you'll notice no one on TV ever sits like this. They're all like, hi, welcome back. You yeah. know, and it's sort of, it's just not natural. And as information sort of travels faster around the world and social media expands and everything else, you can sniff a lack of congruence mm. and integrity a mile off. And you might as well live a congruent life because, because otherwise you're just not living your best life anyway, are you? Yeah. yeah. I had a chat with my mate Cody, actually, and I'd like to get your views on this. Why is it so hard sometimes to be yourself? Why is everybody else trying to be someone else or nervous? Certainly in terms of parenting, that's, that is an interesting one. Mm. Because, you know, I mean, it's one thing coming off to Koh Panyang for a holiday when you're single or you're in a, in a relationship. Full moon party. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But telling my family that we were coming over here for a few months with my son, they were like, but, but, what about this? You know, yeah. what about your flat? What about this and the other? You know, um, and that is just, it felt congruent. We wanted to come. Yeah. And we thought that Stan would like it as well. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the, the expectations that society puts on you. Are difficult and then I mean it's quite interesting like you know meeting people like you like Antonio who's filming this podcast and everyone else I mean, people over here do tend to just do what they want to do and, and be a lot more congruent because they're not because they don't tend to be doing a nine-to-five job that they don't necessarily like mm. and yeah I think when when your mum because obviously she cares for you and she loves you oh, of course yeah you know yeah. when people are doing those things really they're just sort of showing their fears you yeah. know they're not doing it and they're maybe a bit afraid they might not do it or, or sometimes people are a bit jealous and envious it's like they wish they were doing it yeah. but they know that they're not doing it and they see someone like you oh okay I'm going to just jump on a plane we're going to do it obviously it wasn't easy it wasn't straightforward you had to yeah. do a lot of googling <laughs> but then it kind of brings up stuff for other people as mm. well right yeah I mean it's really interesting when we came out here a few years ago the online world has opened up so many opportunities yeah. since then that what you do and um, the, the sort of work that people do over here now has changed so much in the last few years. Yeah. It does allow people to be more authentic. We, you introduced me to a friend the other day. What is her job? I've never heard. Which so, friend was that? So, was it vagina reclamation or? No, I, I, <laughs> oh, miss, I missed that one. Tell me what friend that was. <laughs> We met her, we met her on, a, on, a, on a Saturday morning for, for brunch. Okay. So, um, and you introduced her to Faith. Jamie? 
Yeah. Yeah, Jamie yeah. and Sammy, yeah. one of those two. Yeah, the yeah. women. What, yes. what does Jamie do? What, what job does she Jamie do? Jamie does all the womb, women's womb. Womb, women's. That's it, having yeah. sex with your partners and not getting pregnant without using contraception and stuff like that. I mean, oh, right, again, okay. yeah. actually having yeah. Jamie on this podcast, I'm right, not sure brilliant. when, yeah. but um, it's a topic I haven't got a clue about. Yeah. So that'd be super interesting for exactly. me as well. Exactly. And like, and Faith absolutely loved hearing about that. And I was yeah. like, this, the world needs this. <laughs> yeah. And that is the sort of thing that wasn't really a job 50 years ago, was it? Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, we was in a coffee shop the other day. I can't remember where we was. I think we was doing the, um, the marketing stuff. And I was watching a table opposite us. Yeah. And there was a, a lady, literally, with her partner. And she had a... I was being a bit nosy. And I was just looking at the screen. She had a laptop on a coffee yeah. table. And she literally built a web page. From what I could see, mm. she, while we had our conversation, she'd built like a page on her website. So I'm guessing she was doing some marketing or selling some products. And I was like, what a fascinating world we live in. Yeah. She was uploading photos. She she was changing all the headlines. I don't know whether that was a job or she was freelance or was she selling her own product, yeah. but it comes back to that sense of freedom. Like I think for me, the mission or the message of this podcast is freedom. Yeah, and it's, I mean, you are definitely more in the moment than I am. And so sort of I, I, I think it's really interesting since this is the first, first podcast, I want to ask you a question. Yeah, please. You, yeah. You've ended up in this incredible house. Um, it's just unbelievably beautiful by the sea we've been for a walk this morning we've meditated you do ice baths you've got a great life do you ever think where do i want to be in five years do i do i want to be doing this do i want to be doing what about 20 years do you ever mm. think that or do you just get on with it i get on with it in the moment 100 percent. but yeah. i definitely do have the thoughts actually it's funny you saying that recently more yeah um because we're going to be doing podcasts on a lot more youtube mm. and the books are going to be coming out i'm just like well maybe this i feel like i might outgrow this and i want to travel around the world but I think I'll always come back here. Yeah. Like I want to build and live here and like this is always going to be home. But I do wonder about opportunities and, and actually I like to grow and be around different people just as much as being here. So at the moment, I'm like happy as anything. Um, but maybe to share the message a bit more. Like if I'm really honest, I could just go and sit in the cave in the, in the temple next door. <laughs> There's literally a temple next door to us, right? And I just chill out with the monks. I feel very content. I feel happy. I see, I'm, I think what I struggle with sometimes is are the goals that I've got for this coming from ego or my financial goals coming from greed or are they coming from that place of freedom because I just want to be as integral and as congruent as I can yeah. because I kind of feel like I'm already feel very content and happy but if I'm honest I don't think I want to sit in a, in a, in a cave or in a monastery right now if I could actually share something with people so just to answer that question I'm not 100% sure in 5 or 20 years I've got some very very big goals yeah. um, and I'm just really trusting where the universe or God, whatever you want to label it, takes me as we go along. Yeah. So wherever this podcast goes, it might last for like 10 years. It might last for like 10 sessions. Yeah. I haven't really got a clue, but it, right now it feels like a, it feels fun and mm. it feels passionate. And I follow that more than anything. If the passion kind of goes for me, um, I find it hard not to be integral and congruent. Like you'll know straight away. If I'm not into a movie, I'm like, hmm, I need to get up and go out or... The, the only issue about that is then you fall into the same trap that I do sometimes, which is oh, I've got a bit bored of the podcast. I might just leave that and yeah. go do something else. Yeah, 100%. I, I totally agree with you. I started yeah. a podcast a couple of years ago. So there's actually a few sessions on yeah. uh, iTunes. I've started another book. And so that's why I think this last year for me, I've really had to sit down and go, do I really want to do this podcast? Yeah. Do I really want to stay in the world and not become a monk? And you went and invited me for your first episode. <laughs> what an error. <laughs> <laughs> it's over. This is, actually, I'm not passionate anymore, mate. I'm done. <laughs> So this, like to get to this, doing this actual podcast now, this yeah. has taken me about a year of thinking. Has it? And I know a lot of people go, well, that's overthinking. And I'm like, I don't know. I just wanted to be, I wanted to make sure it was right. I yeah. just wanted to make sure this is what I'm going to do for a couple of years at least. Yeah. You know, because I agree with you. I can't do it for six months and then just jump ship to something new and shiny because that isn't really the way to, to get in the results. But if we do it for a couple of years yeah. and then I'm not feeling it, then yeah. It's all right. I'm already talking ship. about ending a podcast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is the first one, so. It's all right to change course. But you have clearly got such an alive mind, and so have I, yeah. that I have to work at. Because I think when I think the things that have brought the most sort of success, material success, and the things that have resonated with people the most, actually, it tends to be things that I've put a lot of effort into years ago. Yeah. And now the massive long tail of success is still coming. I'm still getting royalties on certain books that I wrote years ago that I don't yeah. even think are very good anymore. And then some of the books that I thought were a lot better nobody bought <laughs> <laughs> I bought one yeah <laughs> the thing that I always think about is what is success so I remember for years I dreamt about living in a luxury villa 
like in Thailand. I was living in my mum's spare bedroom on a little blow up plastic mattress. And at two o'clock at night, I'd have to wake up and blow it back up. Had like 30,000 pounds worth of debt, uh, just come off of drugs and alcohol, that sort of story. And I dreamed about living in this villa. I really wanted to be in Thailand. I wanted to this kind of lifestyle. I didn't know it'd be doing podcasts and writing books, but I just knew that I wanted that freedom. I didn't want to live in the UK. That was just, that was my goal, right? Then, cut a long story short, fast forward, going through like, you know, 10 years of transformation and taking risks and believing in yourself and ups and downs. I walked into this dream villa and I've got this dream villa, salt water swimming pool, free bathrooms and bedrooms. One of the bathrooms was bigger than the prison cell that I actually used to live in. They, <laughs> the views were ridiculous. Antonio was there, we was filming there and we was like, wow, it, it was a beautiful place. Yeah. Um, but I remember posting something about it online and I remember getting a comment from someone in my family saying, oh, well, you've really made it. And I was like, because you've seen the villa. Mm. Like, what about the 10 years of like the depression or the mental health or the suicidal thoughts that I overcame? And because, you know, because everybody don't see what's on the inside. Yeah. Like to me, that is the success. Like the outside then for me just reflects what you're doing on the inside, yeah. if that makes sense. So like I didn't, I don't actually want to share a message of I'm living in a great house in Thailand. I've got all my shit together. Everything's amazing. I still have those crazy thoughts like anybody else. Mm. I think the inner success is more important than what I get on the outside. The outside is just like a, it's lovely to live here, don't get me wrong, and we've got a great podcast studio now. Yeah. But I think that's like the cherry, the icing on the cake, so to speak. Mm. What would you say is success to you? Well, I think I told you before we started recording this podcast, I'm reading this brilliant book at the moment called From Strength to Strength mm. by Arthur C. Brooks. And it is focused on once you come into the second half of your life, how do you define success and what is going to make you happy and mm. fulfilled and he the first part of the book is basically you're pretty fucked once you reach the age of about 35 all your talents go downhill and there are younger hungrier people who are going to do what you're doing now better yeah and then the second half of the book is about how you redefine success and what it means to be successful and he says if you do pick material things which i know you don't but like a three-bed villa by the sea with a saltwater yeah. swimming pool. Those sort of things aren't necessarily going to make you happy. But if you define se- success by the value you can give to other people, specifically your relationships, mm, that, I love that, as you come into the second half of your life and you become more of a sort of elder, um, you've got more wisdom to impart. And those talents and that knowledge keeps on increasing all the way until you die. Mm. So you might not have the energy of a 20-year-old for a to start up where you're living on a mattress on the floor in someone else's house for five years because you haven't got enough money because you're putting it all into the business. But you will have accumulated all this life experience, which you can then enrich other people's lives with, and that'll make you happier as well. Yeah, I love that. And I said that, I think when we was having one of our walks at your house, uh, I stayed at Tony's house over the weekend, and I was like, that this to me, I feel so wealthy now just having a conversation with you or a discussion that we didn't agree about certain yeah. things. And like that, I thrive off of that. And I go home and I have to rethink about stuff or even just like finding a little stand and singing happy birthday and we're at the elephants. Like it didn't matter how much, how big my house was or how much money was in the bank account. Those yeah. moments to me are so priceless. And I think, I mean, look, I've, I chose the path of being a TV presenter, a job which millions of people want to do. There's obviously like a very, for me, it was a very tiny sort of amount of sort of being in the public eye, which my ego quite liked. And I think a lot of it probably was quite ego driven, you know. Yeah. And when I left that job, I thought, oh, am I going to miss when people ask me at a party, what do you do? Yeah. Say, I'm a TV presenter, <laughs> yeah. noticing their reaction. <laughs> and actually, luckily for my ego and for me, I don't miss it at all. Really? Um, but um But the reality of that job is the same as the reality of every other job. Once I'd done it for a few years, it had its moments that were great and it had its moments that were not so great. Mm -hmm. Talking about sport for a living sounds amazing, but when you're commentating on Darlington versus Lincoln for the fourth time in a row at midnight on a Saturday night, it's not so much fun. Yeah. (laughs) And what about now? Now, like I see you on your laptop, you're looking at all your like uh, figures and the book covers and this stuff and you're actually in Thailand. What, I mean, that's obviously such a world of difference, right? Rather than being a presenter on TV. Is this the life? Is this a kind of like a lifestyle for you? Like now, you you could never go back to that lifestyle. Oh, I could never go back. Yeah, and it, but the thing is, I was always doing this on the side. Mm. I was always oh, the self help guy. He's a TV presenter at Sky, but he's a self that he, he does the, the the personal development stuff on the side. But now I just like it. You know, I just feel fulfilled by it. I'm not great at having a boss, so mm. this is a quite a sort of authentic life for me. Um, and I'm making it work, so there be there would be no reason to go back. 
And occasionally LinkedIn emails me with like, oh, there's a, there's a job that pays very well presenting the ITV regional news in Bristol. And I'm like, no way. You never ever get like a little moment of, oh, maybe. <laughs> Absolutely not. No? I don't think there's any job for any media organisation which I would take and be happy. So you're, even though there's lots of risks involved, even though sometimes it's uncertain now, what you're doing now, this is more for you. Yeah, and the thing is, there's obviously, you know, you've got to, you got to sort of provide for your family. You got to make sure there's food on the table. And if it was a complete failure and nothing was going well, then I would have to rethink. Yeah. Um, but it's all right for the moment, so it's fine. Yeah. Would Just, you say? Would you say if people follow their passion, they can turn it into some kind of profit? Like yours is writing. You enjoy writing. You enjoy health, and you enjoy energy. So you're writing about what you enjoy. You know your passion. Is that possible for everybody? I'm following my passion. Yeah. So, but is that possible for everyone? I don't know. I mean, I. I've had friends from many different diverse backgrounds and I've got friends who are bankers and make an obscene amount of money and I've got friends who work in fringe theatre and get by on virtually nothing. And I honestly can't say that one group is happier than the other group. Yeah. But the only thing is that the bankers tend to have nicer holidays and don't worry about putting food on the table quite so much. Yeah. So you've got to have enough money to feel okay. Yeah. But I mean, all, all the research suggests that about $50,000 is the sort of peak of the happiness curve. And after that, you can make loads more money, you won't get any happier. Mm. It, you won't necessarily get less happier, but what you need to be happy isn't that much. It's, it's security, food, shelter, the odd holiday, mm. making sure people around you are sort of healthy. And then beyond that, money is not gonna make you happy anyway. Yeah, I think it, when you've got money in the bank, it creates less stress and less worries because you can, like you say, take a holiday or feed yourself and your family. Yeah. It's funny you saying that, it just made me think of the first job that I really enjoyed um, was a volunteer job. Like I loved all my other jobs, you know, I was a scaffolder, I was a builder, I worked for a car company, we blacked yeah. out windows and that was all paid full-time jobs. So yeah. I kind of had to get up on a Monday, go to the job I, yeah. and I kind of, I'm a positive person so I just get on with it. Yeah. But I never forget when I became a volunteer in a drug and alcohol drop-in centre and at the time I was working seven o'clock at night in a factory till four o'clock in the morning stacking shelves mm. just to pay my credit card bills, just to kind of get by and that's when I was living at my mum's. I would wake up at eight o'clock in the morning after a few hours sleep mm. and I would go and volunteer in this place where like, yeah, it stunk, you know, that homeless people were all over the place. Some of them were off their faces on drugs and I wasn't getting paid a penny for it. Yeah. I stayed late, I did overtime and I loved it. Yeah. And I absolutely, that was when I realized, wow, that this is my passion. Yeah. And I don't think I've ever really left that. Like in the last 10 years, I haven't had a boss, you know, I've been kind of like here, there and everywhere doing little projects. It's always been something that I've enjoyed. And it's not yeah. always been easy. There's been definitely times when there's been no money in the bank account, but I never went back. I never wanted to take that step back. I always decided to keep following the passion. Yeah. I kind of think that people can do that, but I just wonder whether it's the other things that might stop them, like taking the risk to move to Thailand, putting yourself out there and starting a YouTube channel, maybe even just believing that you can actually do it. Yeah. Yeah, and you've got such a... I mean, you have such a different background to a lot of people in this world. Mm. You know, I mean, I've said this to you already today. Your story and your background is extraordinary, isn't it? Mm. And I think that allows you to... Uh, approach people in quite a different way. I, I just, I don't see many people who empathise with people from all, all different walks of life. I was just thinking about, there were, you invited me to a yoga day once and there were hundreds of uh, yogis in this uh, warehouse in Bermondsey Street. Do you remember this? Yeah, and yeah. I, and, I, and I went and I was, cause it was walking different distance from my flat and it was a really good day. And I was sitting next to somebody who frankly stank. He really smelled and he was sort of, wasn't dressed like all the other yogis. And uh, he seemed to be really enjoying himself, but I just noticed the smell. And then afterwards, you told me that he was homeless and he was sleeping on the, on the sort of, on the step of the place where we had the yogi. And, we you, and you asked him in. Yeah, we, couldn't get, we couldn't get in because he had his sleeping bag. Yeah. And I think he had drink by him as yeah. well as so he was drinking. Yeah. And we couldn't get in the door. And I'm not going to lie, I did notice the smell. During yeah, I think the everyone class. did. <laughs> but... But funnily enough, because I lived around there, I saw him for years afterwards and I became good friends no with him. No way. I, I, I would always say hello to him. I'd always talk to him. and I never knew that. I never would have chatted to him and I never would have connected with him if it, wouldn't have, if it wasn't for the fact that you 
did that first connection. Yeah, I never so knew that. Really, yeah, yeah. No, I saw him for years around the place, and he was lovely, wasn't he? I think, really? I think he might be an Italian, but ended up living in London. Yeah, really just nice sort of guy. Down on his luck, and. That's the sort of thing that you do that most people don't do. It's a bit different from what we were talking about, but it's but you are able to connect with people in that way. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, it probably gets more likes on the podcast, so uh, subscribe <laughs> below. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I remember he was actually, he had his blue sleeping bag. He was sitting there. We couldn't open the door. We had boxes to carry. Yeah. And he was like, oh, and it could have gone one way or the other way because like we was waking him up from his little home, bless him. Yeah. And you ended, he ended up helping out. I actually, I, yeah. I, I said, grab a box, get yeah. in there. You can have a free day. And yeah. you know what? Honestly, I'm not exaggerating. We had lots of volunteers there and I'm so so respectful and I love everyone. Mm. He he worked his ass off. Yeah. Like he loved, he gave, and I've always thought about that and that's what I felt coming back to the volunteering place. Yeah. People just loved it because I saw them. Yeah. You know, I was learning so much from them just as much as they was learning from me. It's like they just had a bit of purpose. I was yeah. like, yes, yeah, all right, you're taking drugs, but just have a bit of purpose in life. Yeah. And we just gave him a purpose to carry boxes, sweep up the floor, move around. And every now yeah. and then I could see him shoot off down the alleyway and have a little swig of his drink. But he always came back yeah. and uh, he tried the yoga, yeah. yeah. I, I forgot all about that until okay. you mentioned yeah. that. Hello, you amazing viewer. I hope you're enjoying this video and I've got some really exciting news for you. You know that moment when you're reading a book and it just ignites that light bulb moment for you. It wakes something up inside you, that passion, that enthusiasm, or that spark for life. Well, the big announcement is my new book, Awaken Your Spirit, is ready for either pre-order, or depending on when you're watching this book, you can order your copy right now. Over the last couple of years, I've poured my heart and soul into writing Awaken Your Spirit. I don't know about you, but sometimes that voice inside the head just never seems to shut up. Well, this book shows you a step-by-step -step process on how to really close your eyes and go inside and separate from this monkey mind and this never-ending conversation that goes round and round and round. Whether you're seeking inner peace, you're looking to recharge your batteries, or you want to feel more grounded and in harmony with life, this book has got something for you and it's going to show you how to connect to a very deeper level within you. Now, I don't want to keep any more of your time Get back to the interview, and again, if you're somebody that really is looking to get back in the driving seat of your life, master this monkey mind, reach your full potential, and ignite that excitement, that enthusiasm, and that passion for life, make sure you will awaken your spirit just below. Have an amazing day, and enjoy the rest of the video. So you, you were just talking about following your passion, weren't yeah. you? And I think like definitely be congruent, do something that resonates, but following your passion isn't always great advice. I mean, there's a, there's a saying in the book world, which is where I sort of spend most of my time now writing. And, and that is writing to market, where fiction writers in particular will write very specific genre fiction based on what people like. Mm. So like, for example, you've got romance, which is a genre, but there's like hundreds of different subgenres of romance, like the sort of cozy romance, which or, or cozy mystery. And then there's sort of dominatrixes and all That's that. That's the one you write. Yeah, yeah, obviously, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's my pen name, I don't publish that under mine. Um, and, you know, you could follow your passion, but if that's something that's not going to resonate, does it matter to you if no one's going to buy it? Yeah. So I think I th be, be congruent, but also, you know, you have to be sort of practical as well. Yeah, and I think, I think that's a really good point, actually, because you people do throw that around, right? Follow your passion. But I'm like, yeah, but that then means you've got to have a lot of discipline. Yeah. You've got to take a lot of risks yeah. and you've got to be committed and devoted to your passion. It's taken me 10, 15 years to get here yeah. and nobody sees those hard days and all don't. the struggles and the times I talk myself out of it and, you know, a lot worse than that, if I'm very honest. But I carried on following, but then after following your passion, there's a thousand things like that get you to, to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, or the other thing is follow your passion and you're going to be successful or make loads of money. It's like, well, if you're following your passion to do that, that probably isn't your passion. It may be more of an ego thing. It's like, you wouldn't care if you was making money from it. Like at a volunteering place, I was getting nothing and I was so passionate. I had my purpose and it was amazing. And then I obviously the purpose always changes in life. So I totally agree. You can say follow your passion, but you've also got to back it up with, you need to discipline yourself. You've yeah. got to take the actions and it might not work out. So be okay with never making no money out of it. But if it's what you want to do with your life, then do it. There's no rules to life, you know? And in terms of following your passion and living in Thailand, I mean, it's just <laughs> so amazing. We just see the sea behind the cameras over there. Yeah. Do you think that as the world's changing, more and more people will do this? 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it since COVID. Have you? There's a lot more people on their computers now building businesses. Yeah. There's a lot more people doing e-commerce, drop shipping, yeah. writing books, whatever it is. And I think that's why I love technology, the AI and all of this stuff. Mm. It does. I think it creates freedom for people just as much as it creates 
enslavement. Like you can be so addicted yeah. to scrolling on your phone and Instagram, or you can set up an e-commerce website and make thousands and millions of pounds and just check your, your ad account like 20 minutes a day. So it depends on how you use it, but I do definitely think a lot more people, and especially Copang Yang, where we are right now, like to me, this is kind of like, I don't even want to use the word, but I'm going to say it. It's kind of like a bit of a spiritual hub. Yeah. Like people come here on a journey. They want some kind of healing or they're looking to practice tantra, yoga, meditation. Um, so I feel like a lot more people are drawn to more of an alternative way of life. But I, I say that because, I've, and I've been here for seven years, I haven't got a clue what it's like in London. People are like, what are you want about, mate? You're mad. Do you, do you know what I mean? So would you say that you can see that from your point of view in London? Uh, and then more I mean, people... Certainly, attitudes are cha changing quite quickly over time. As I said, when I joined Sky, I was the self-help guy. And I, I sort of felt like a bit of a fish out of water. I felt like my values were quite different to everybody else's mm. values and what I was interested in, I was interested in. I mean, certainly there's a sports psychology element which is quite strong in the world of sport, which I always felt dovetailed in quite nicely with my role in NLP. But then as I worked, as I sort of progressed through the ranks at, at Sky and as time went on, people would seek me out and say, oh, Tony, I've seen you write about this. I'd love to yeah. chat to you about this. And actually by, you know, I mean, it's just become so much more acceptable to be into wellness. And meditation. Wellness. When I first started meditation, people thought I was in a cult. Yeah. They thought I'd lost the plot. Yeah. yeah. I think the world is definitely becoming more acceptable about these ways of life because the other way of life, this nine to five structure and... You know, I'm not into the conspiracy theories, but there's definitely, everybody knows there's some kind of power or control and we've got to keep the system going, this kind of modern day slavery. So I think now actually people are seeing this kind of like, you know, online world or meditation or wellness as an opportunity of freedom, you know? Yeah. I wrote in the next one of the books, the goal beneath all of the goals is a sense of freedom. I don't care whether you want to make loads of money, whether you want to fall in love, whether you want to live in a house in Thailand or even lose weight. There's a sense of freedom beneath all of it. Yeah. It could be financial freedom. It could be love, being yourself and meeting somebody. It could even just be freedom from that voice that's inside your head that never shuts up. The goal beneath all the goals is just to be free. Mm. I think that's our spirit. Yeah. And I've been mentioning living out here in the book I'm writing at the moment, which is about burnout. And I, I went through this like, severe case of burnout a few years ago, which is all the stuff that makes me super interested in neuro-linguistic programming and achieving and writing books means that I'm also very type A. And I don't really slow down. And at that point, there were raging addictions going on as well. Mm. And I just had this crash and spent three months in bed. And I've, I've sort of said in the book, I'm writing this from a cafe in Thailand. My solution to you is not to come live in a cafe in Thailand. Yeah. And I think always being... What would the solution be then? Yeah. What was the steps? Well, the, 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 the steps is firstly take sort of immediate steps to release some of that tension, all the overthinking that we were talking about mm. before, that was making the, pro the, the problem worse. I was in my sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, and I couldn't just slow down and start to heal. And I'm prone to that anyway, which makes me want to do stuff like what we've done this morning more. And then it's reconnecting with people in nature, it's getting a proper amount of rest, it's not looking at your phone in the middle of the night, yeah. um, and it's doing a lot of uh, gentle exercise as well all, all of which is proven by science and sort of not rocket science mm -hmm. common sense um, I always say this it's common sense yeah but it's not common practice yeah it's common sense to drink two bottles of water every day you're going to have more energy but it's not common practice because we're drinking coffees and we're too busy doing other stuff yeah and that's and that's and, and so coming back to the point about living over here I'm sort of quite conscious of telling people about this life over here and how amazing it is mm. but also being mindful of, of the fact that you know, during COVID, there were certain things that still needed to be open and it tended to be the low paid jobs. We still needed to get our Amazon deliveries or whatever it was. And it tended to be the people that we really needed to keep us alive, like the doctors and the nurses as well. Mm. And they're still going to be doing nine to five or worse or sort of, you know, shift work, mm. regardless of how the world changes over the next 20 mm. years. So I'm always trying to, trying to be mindful of that when I'm writing about it so that somebody reading this book doesn't say, you absolute wanker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because you're... Because I'm living the dream here in Thailand, writing from a cafe, to two hours a day doing writing, and they're, and they're doing a 12-hour junior doctor shift. It's funny, because I would look at that in a way, it's like, wow, what an inspiration. He's gone through the burnout, he's gone through all this, and now he's living the dream in Thailand, if that makes sense. Yeah. Rather than people thinking, wow, what an absolute wanker. Who's he? How can he tell me this? He doesn't know... Like, a lot of people say to me, oh, you're lucky. 
I'm like, are you su-? like, because I live here and I've got this lifestyle. I'm like, luck. Like, are you serious? There yeah. is no luck. I don't believe like involved in this. Like, it was a decision twelve years ago. It was action. It was a lot, a lot of discipline. And if I'm honest, it was a lot of taking a good look at yourself mm. and realizing that you're very deluded in the mind because you're full of stories and yeah. it's those that create our suffering. Then 10, 15 years later, you're living in a beautiful house on the beach in Thailand or like you say on the thing. Yeah. It's like, wow, I think it might be hard for people to see that as an inspiration though because that's what we really, they want that maybe or they, they get jealous, you know, we get a bit envious of other people living that. But mate, I mean, where, from where you've come from, a prison cell, to where you are, it's just an extraordinary journey. Yeah. And we've been talking about your book coming out this morning. I just want to keep emphasizing that is an incredible story. I can never hear enough of it because it's so amazing. I appreciate what it. What was it? A drug deal in the prison library or what something? Was it? it all started when a drug deal in the prison library went wrong. <laughs> so I went to a temple and learned how to meditate, <laughs> something like that. In the prison library. Yeah. So even once you went to prison, you still didn't get it. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant, mate. Yeah. No, yeah. Tone, I really appreciate having you on. It's been an absolute like uh, pleasure to have you as the first guest we can talk all day long let's just do a couple of like um, quick fire round questions just for people at home that are listening like I totally see your point as well like you can't just run off and leave your life if you've got stuff and responsibilities but then I also see like wow it could be an inspiration for people to have something to head towards yeah oh god yeah so let's just imagine right the the audience that I want to connect with they're people that are just watching this podcast they're listening to it somewhere that they're at home they're going through something it could be a burnout it could be an addiction it could just be like oh I don't know what my purpose is yeah What would be your first kind of action step for them to take? First action step would be, imagine Brett sitting here without a T-shirt on, (laughs) which is, I thought you, before we started recording, you didn't have your T-shirt on because you said, oh mate, I'm going to get too hot. And I thought you were going to do the whole podcast with no shirt on. I was like, should I take mine off as well? (laughs) Brilliant. (laughs) We'd probably get a lot of unsubscribers then, wouldn't we? Yeah, I know, yeah. Amazing. yeah. Yeah. It would be... Find, I mean, if you're going through something immediate, you know, I mean, the first step is find something, some way to release the stress and the tension and that fight or flight response. Yeah. So for me, it was emotional freedom therapy or tapping uh, and some of the neuro-linguistic programming stuff, the hypnosis. Yeah. And also there's an amazing book called um, Self-Help for Your Nerves, written in the 1950s wow. by Dr. Claire Weeks, who was just an absolute pioneer. She was diagnosed with tuberculosis in her, 20, in her 20s and told she was going to die. And then uh, sort of just spent loads of years feeling a bit sorry for herself and thinking, I haven't died yet. And then the doctor <laughs> said, oh, sorry, we made a mistake. You haven't got tuberculosis. You just no had a cough. No way. Yeah. And then she became a doctor herself and wrote all these best-selling books. And what she wrote, if you were to read those books now, they do seem quite old-fashioned, but her techniques are so fantastic. And really, it's everything we've been talking about today in terms of facing what you're going through head on, Mm. floating through it, accepting it, and then letting time pass because things do get better. Nice. I like that a lot. Next question. We were sitting down a couple of nights ago reading your amazing, cutest son, um, a book about space. Yeah. What was the biggest discovery you learned about space? Because there was some (laughs) insights. We was like, whoa, it was was deep. I, I cannot get my head around the fact that some scientists believe that space goes on forever. It goes on forever. Boom. <laughs> That's insane. The one that got me was it took millions of years to fly from one side of the Milky yeah. Way to the other. If you were to fly from one side of the Milky Way to the other in a rocket, it would take millions of years. That is insane. I know. And that really gets, when we were meditating this morning, I was like, go out into space and just let go of your name and your body for a moment. Yeah. That, that kind of um, level of connection or oneness to me, that just gives me, it gives me the goosebumps to think of, on one scale, how tiny we are yeah. in this huge multiple, multiple universes, but then compared to like an atom and a cell inside your body, mm. how huge and how gigantic you really are. The, the scale of it is mind boggling. Mm. And we were both saying, like, I didn't really get into space when I was growing up, mm. but I'm loving the fact that Stan is into it because yeah. we can do it loads. Well, that's yeah. just as we kind of like end it there. Like that's one thing that I want to give you so much credit for. The way that you and Faith, your partner, bring up your child you know, the way that you talk about boundaries with him, the way that you kind of like, you know, positively give him that discipline, it, it's, uh, it's amazing, mate, honestly. I'm, I'm blown away, yeah, and he's such a beautiful child that you can see that even just reading books about space mm. or like talking to him in a certain way, not saying no all the time, like that is, is really developing his um, belief system, you know. I think a lot of us get screwed up by our parents, not blaming the parents, and the parents just don't know if you just keep saying no to somebody or if you don't really give them that positive discipline, yeah. you know, that, that child is going to grow up in, in an unhealthy way, I believe, like addictions and habits yeah. and trauma. And, and 
and sort of that's a nice way to bring it sort of full circle because everything I spoke about there in terms of when you're going through something, it's all about connecting with the emotion mm. um, to allow yourself to then sort of live with it and, and release it a little bit more yeah. effectively. And I mean, he is obsessed with death at the moment, which all children go through. Yeah. And it's not really a Western thing to talk to about talk death. About from a young age and make it sort of part of life, which obviously it is, we all yeah. go through it. Yeah. Um, and actually we've sort of tried to do it a bit differently. And we've been reading this beautiful book about that. It's called The Day the Sea Came Out and Didn't Come Back. And I, you were there when, when yeah. I read it to him. And I, I just like, every time I read it, I cry yeah. <laughs> to him. Cause, cause I felt, but he's just totally matter of factor at it. Cause yeah. he's, you know, because we're sort of making it a quite a normal thing that well, everybody does die. I think that's fascinating. Cause it's not until you get a bit older, you know, death isn't normal. Mm. And we live in a society, it's like be younger and look good. And it's mm. like, we're trying to avoid the inevitable. I read a book by Yogi Nityanda and he says, close your eyes and just welcome death in, say hello. Yeah. Imagine your last breath. And that honestly, I know it sounds mad. It's not morbid. But that has given me such a level of freedom. Yeah. I'm like, oh my God. And then like, why do we teach children that actually we're not talking about death? Maybe it's not something you want to talk about every Sunday at the dinner table. No, but exactly. if the child brings it up yeah. like Stan is, yeah. it's not, oh, don't talk about that. It's just, oh, okay, let's have a conversation. Every like, yeah, yeah, the book was brilliant. Yeah. And realizing that it is a normal part of life, but mm. also the best thing to do is talk about it rather than hide it away. Yeah. Where then it becomes something more scary. Yeah. But anyway, he's look, there's a little dragon in it called Eric. And it's just beautiful the way that Eric deals with his grief of the sea going out and yeah. not coming back. I love it. Amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Tony, you've got an NLP practitioner course. You've got lots of books out. What is the best place for somebody to come and read any of your books or begin this journey? Um, I know that the podcast is called Zestology, yeah. but what's the website and yeah, stuff? Yeah, thank you. You can Google Zestology or my name, Tony Wrighton, and TonyWrighton.com has got everything there the NLP practitioner course, which I'm working on at the moment. I, I qualified in NLP. Uh, 20 years ago and then I qualified in teaching other people NLP about 19 years ago and ever since I've been writing books on it but I've not been teaching it yeah. and people say to me where can I go to learn NLP and I never quite know where to send them so I thought I'll do it myself do it yourself yeah. and the thing that I love about you is like I've done a lot of NLP years ago and it was just these old without seeing too judgmental overweight guys in this kind of conference <laughs> wearing like yeah. big baggy clothes and, and, and it was a bit I don't know just it, what they was actually saying I thought was phenomenal NLP is yeah. amazing but I just the energy was off and I, I think one of your titles or something that I read today when I was overlooking your shoulder was yeah. the non-boring way yeah. it was like the podcast uh, the podcast <laughs> the NLP learn it in the non-boring way or some, some, it was something like that and that's what I feel like your gift is is like you bring that character you make it not so boring so highly recommend that if you want to check out tony go and listen to tony's stuff um there'll be some show notes underneath the podcast or the video tony thank you so much mate, mate thank you i'm honored to be the first podcast i'm quite sweaty now yeah crack open these coconuts <laughs> yeah, shall we <laughs> have an amazing day <laughs> Hello viewers, thank you so much for watching this video. I'm hoping that you enjoyed it just as much as we enjoyed making it. We love this adventure we're on, we love growing this community, and we would love you to actually help us. So I've got a favor to ask you. Make sure that you subscribe below, and if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, and turn that notification button on, because that actually helps us with the algorithm. In other words, it's gonna help us reach more people and spread this ripple effect. And I really appreciate your time and energy for watching any video. So if you've got any comments or questions or queries, make sure you pop them in the box below. By subscribing, you are going to be one of the first people to know when we release new content. If you really wanna take your journey and your growth to the next level, make sure you watch this next video and have an amazing day. Once again, thank you so much for your time and your energy. See you in the next video.